This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. I had a uh, two two day meeting in in uh, Washington uh, at the National Academy of Sciences. You know, there's this National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, and the National Academy of Engineering all form what are called the National Academy of Sciences, and. Um, so I am co-editing uh, a manual on the, uh, uh, it's called the, the Federal Manual on Admission of Scientific Evidence in Federal Courtrooms. And so sort of the, the defining instrument that all federal judges use as to the admissibility of scientific and engineering evidence. Um, so it's a fairly important committee. How did you end up on it? How did I end up on it? Usually you end up on these things because you open your mouth too much. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm good at that. Um, well, it, it started that I'm on a, a committee called Science, Law, and Technology, which is a standing committee of the National Academy of Sciences. And we commission works to be done by other groups. And this was one work that we commissioned to have done and decided that somebody on the committee ought to be essentially doing the work and um, so I'm, I'm but I have a group of people that help me because we we have chapters in this book on toxicology and epidemiology and statistics and probability and um, case law management and um, DNA forensic evidence and so forth but federal judges who hear these very technical cases sometimes n need a quick look into the case law uh, that's highly technical and it needs to be written in a way that they can understand it. And, uh, and this is also sponsored by the Federal Judicial Center, which trains uh, federal judges on how to be a federal judge. So if you get appointed by a president, you don't necessarily know how to be a federal judge, so you go to school, actually. And um, there's about 600 federal, six, 700 federal judges in the country. Um, so anyway, I don't have control over when those meetings are set. And uh, while I complain when they're set during a quarter I'm teaching, uh, it falls on deaf ears. Because most of the other people that are on the committee don't have day jobs, and um, so they don't care. And what complicated things, too, is the pope was there. And so I had competition. Uh, <laughs> and um, not as many people came to see me as uh, I usually do. So, uh, how about a hand for Max, huh? I mean, he, come on. Poor guy, poor guy came in here. Did, you, did he feed you some food? Mm -hmm. That's good. Fat ketchup. Oh yeah, fat ketchup. So, uh, you finished off aphoresis and you took your trip, your field trip, and uh, he, he laid the groundwork for the design of a high fructose corn syrup plant. So. Let's see what you remember. What is uh, high fructose corn syrup? <coughs> syrup. Syrup. Okay, red, you got, and then somebody else wanted to just say it's high fructose. And <laughs> it's cheaper than sugar. What is it, what's it, con what does it contain? Fructose. Fructose. fructose and glucose as a mixture in water. And so if I say I have 55% high fructose corn syrup, what, how would you describe that to me? What's in it? 55% by, by what? Weight? Fructose? How much um, is it that? Or is it volume? Or what? So if it's fructose and uh, glucose, is that what it is? Fructose and glucose. So if I have some high fructose corn syrup and I remove all the water into which these sugars are dissolved, I'm left with what ratio of fructose and glucose if it's 55% high fructose corn syrup? Max? 
I was just going to ask you what you told them. I mean, um, doesn't have, seem to have set real well. Uh, so <clears throat> let me see. If I, I oh, no wonder they're staring at me like it's. Uh, all right. Well, we'll, all right. So we'll get to that today then. Uh, let's see. Well, he told you something about how it's made, didn't he? Uh, it's. Where do you start with? What's your raw material? Cornstarch. Corn and cornstarch is a polymer of what? Glucose. It's a polymer of glucose. And so the game is to chop this up into monomeric units of glucose. So now you end up with pure glucose. And then what do you do to that glucose to make it into high fructose corn syrup? You use an enzyme. You use an enzyme. What kind of enzyme do you use? You, what do you use? OK, you use an amylase, but what do you use the amylase for? The what? This would act like a catalyst for sorts, and the glucose comes into the enzyme and just bonds to it. So the enzyme, uh, the alpha amylase, bonds to the starch, which is a polymer of glucose, and chops it up. But it doesn't chop it up completely. It gives you monomer glucose, it gives you dimers of glucose, and it gives you trimers of glucose. Because fundamentally, it doesn't like to eat from the end. So you use another enzyme, which is called what? Glucoamylase. And that takes the dimers and trimers, chops them up into monomers, so that you, what you end up with are monomers of glucose. Now we have to isomerize that to a mixture of glucose and fructose. And we use glucose isomerase to do that. So it takes three enzymes to uh, carry out these chemical reactions. Now these are done on a very large scale. I mean, these are done in vessels that are two and three stories high and 15, 20 feet in diameter. And in fact, it's high fructose corn syrup, as, as I'm sure uh, Max told you, that uh, basically displaced the, uh, a lot of the sugar market, sucrose, table sugar, which came primarily from sugarcane and beets. And in fact, it collapsed, for all intents and purposes, the Hawaii market for sugar cane and the Cuban market, and most of the Brazilian market. That's where <coughs> we used to get a lot of sugar from. And in response to that, the Hawaiians um, basically didn't do much. They just built more hotels. The, um, the Cubans, uh, it's not clear what they're doing. And the Brazilians uh, made ethanol out of a, a lot of that and uh, <coughs> legislated it had to be put into uh, automobiles in Brazil. And then in some sense, that's where this corn ethanol for, uh, has, has come from, from the Brazilian experience. The problem is, is that people uh, impress the Brazilian economy onto how corn ethanol might work in this country. Um, but we don't have a Brazilian economy, and so it doesn't work all that well. And it's really not clear to me that making uh, ethanol out of uh, corn is, uh, is a terribly good idea. Uh, there are other ways that it can be done, and you can use other substrates, but I won't get into that. Um, so let's, uh, let's do a simple economic analysis to see so the whole idea about design is that what you try to do is come up with a concept. Our concept is we want to make high fructose corn syrup. And then you can usually do a sort of a back of the envelope economic calculation to see whether or not this makes sense. Because we don't want to turn what into what? Gold into lead. Gold into lead okay. So <clears throat> this is a first cut economic calculation. So if you take a, a corn, unfortunately, is sold in something called a bushel. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is find out what does that mean. And uh, what it means is it's basically 56 pounds of wet corn. So this is the corn after the little kernels have been stripped off the cob. And uh, it turns out that 
if you dry this, you end up with 48.1 pounds of dry material. So that means there's 7.1 pounds of water uh, in uh, a bushel of corn. And we're going to put it in a little plant here, and we're going to do something called milling it, which means extract material from the little corn kernels. And the material you can extract is you can extract corn oil. You can extract a fraction of it, which can go to feed, animal feed, a corn meal, which can actually be so, sold in the uh, human consumption food market, uh, and starch. But look what you get. You get 1.6 pounds of oil out of this uh, 56 pounds wet. You get 12.5 pounds of feed, 2.5 pounds of meal, 31.5 pounds of starch. That adds up to 48.1 pounds and you have 7.9 pounds of water, which adds up to the 56. So this is what you can get. So the next thing you ask is, well, what can I sell this stuff for? Because you have to sell it in such a way that ultimately you can make some kind of a profit. I mean, this isn't St. Anthony's Kitchen. And you've got to uh, at least break even. I mean, break even is not even good enough. I mean, you'd be fired for that. You, you have to make, make some profit. So let's take a look and see what the costs are. Uh, corn, uh, priced wet, is 4.7 uh, cents a pound, and we have 56 pounds of it. So that's uh, uh, not purchased, but the cost per bushel, and to, and to uh, uh, get it into the plants, $2.63. Now, how much can we make by processing this? Well, for the oil, which sells at about uh, 27 cents a pound, and we make 1.6 pounds of it, we can get a 43 cents from the feed, we can get 55 cents from the meal. We can get, looks like, 33 cents or so. Anyway, we can get about a buck 31 out of these three products. And now we've got the starch left over. Now, it's $2.63 is what went into this, and we've now made $1.31. Is that pretty good business? <laughs> in, in Berkeley? Yeah, well, it was in those days, I suppose. So what we need to do is is do something with this starch. And uh, we're not going to be able to sell this starch and uh, make up this, uh, we at least need a dollar, another dollar thirty-one, and then we need more for profit and depreciation and building the plant and all that stuff. So let's see what we can do with the starch. And that's why high fructose corn syrup is, is so attractive to people who grow corn, because uh, they can sell it into the high fructose corn syrup market, as opposed to just growing corn for meal and feed and oil, and then having to figure out what to do with the starch, otherwise losing their shirt uh, in, the, in the process. So we, uh, our little company, the E20 Hound Dogs, have decided that what we'll do is uh, take this starch and we'll put it into a plant with some enzymes and uh, we'll make high fructose corn syrup. Now, do you recall from the last lecture that when you take starch, which is this polymer of glucose, every time you cut a bond, what gets added across it? OK, a molecule of water gets added every time you cut the bond to complete the glucose molecule. So this plant of ours is going to consume starch, say with a basis of 31.5 pounds, it's going to also consume about three and a half pounds of water because one mole of water is going in for every one mole of glucose that gets uh, put, uh, uh, gets produced. So we actually make 35 pounds of high fructose corn syrup from 31.5 pounds of starch. Now this is on a dry basis. Don't get confused because we're adding water. When we talk about wet and dry basis, we're talking about whether or not the product exists in water such as the fructose and glucose dissolved in water. And it's usually sold, as we'll see, uh, at about 70% uh, solids, which means that if I take uh, 100 mLs of high fructose corn syrup, that 70% of that is going to be solids, and 30% of it's going to be water. Don't confuse it with this water, because this water gets molecularly added into the material. The water appears as hydrogen and oxygen attached to the glucose. So some people get 
mixed up thinking that this water has something to do whether it's a wet or dry basis. That has nothing to do with that at all because this is actually a reactant that gets consumed in the reaction to produce high fructose corn syrup. So how do you know that it's 35 pounds? Well, it's 31.5 pounds of starch is, confer is converted to what? Well, what is this ratio? 180 pounds per pound mole over 162 pounds per pound mole. What's that a ratio of? The top one is glucose, and this bottom one is starch. And so you can see this, is, this difference of 18 is the molecular weight of what? Water, which gets added across the bonds when these starch molecules are hydrolyzed. It gives you 35 pounds, which means that we're going to need 3.5 pounds of water. So our plant is going to have to have a hose coming into it which is you know, providing the water that gets taken up in this reaction. We also need to supply additional water to dissolve our product to produce what is known as a 42% high fructose corn syrup, which is 42% fructose, 58% glucose, and 70% solids. So what does it mean? It means if I take 100 ml, that 30 of that will be water. And then the rest of it, if I took all the water away, I'd be left with a powder. And that powder would be 58% glucose and 42% fructose, if I were to take it to dryness. Yeah? If the water is coming from 3.5 pounds of water that you have, where is that water, the 30% water coming from? You, you have another hose, which you, you uh, dissolve it in. And all these reactions take place in an aqueous phase anyway. Okay. So you have, you know, it's happening in water but it's consuming some water and locking it up in hydrogen and oxygen bonds that come with your product. Um, in fact, high fructose corn syrup is not sold as a solid. Um, if you try to dry it, it gets just terribly nasty and gooey. It's very hydroscopic. And so it's sold as a liquid in tank cars, railroad tank cars. Um, it's sold in buckets and barrels. There's another product, uh, high fructose corn syrup, 55%, uh, which is 55% fructose, 45% glucose, also 70% solids, sold as a liquid. Now, why do you think it's 42% fructose? Do you think somebody said, hey, uh, that's a cool thing you know, to design or plan around? What do you think drives the 42%? What, wait, what reaction's happening? The enzyme, which is converting Glucose to a mixture of glucose and fructose is limited by what? What do you remember about the law of mass action? Probably nothing. So, because um, you had that last year. Um, so the enzyme, if you let it work on a solution of glucose and you wait long enough, it sort of approaches a mixture of 42,58. And because enzymes sometimes also work in reverse. And so you sort of end up with this equilibrium mixture of 42% fructose, 58% glucose. Now, you can take this. How would you take this mixture and make this out of it? What would you have to do? Go ahead. What would you do? I, I give you this. And what, what would you have to do with this solution to get to this solution? You want to make more fructose, don't you? So you're going to need to use what? More of this glucose. So you're going to have to take this material, separate out some of the glucose, run it through the isomerizer again in order to enrich it and get a higher fructose value. So that means more processing. What if you remove the fructose so that it makes more fructose? What if, I'm sorry? What if you remove the fructose in the product? Uh, removing the fructose from the product is sort of equivalent to removing the glucose from the product. You're, you've got to separate the two. So you can think of it either way. Um, the, uh, the glucose, you can also uh, sell glucose corn syrup. What glucose corn syrup is, is what you get before you isomerize it. And so that has zero fructose in it. It's 100% glucose. It happens to be sold on the, on the market at 60% solids. 
A lot of this is driven by things like viscosity. If things get too viscous, they get really difficult to pump. Uh, they get difficult to handle. Or you can actually buy glucose as 100% glucose as 100% solids. So this would be a powder. Uh, this is also known as dextrose. For those of you that buy high, these little high energy things called dextrose to, to get, you know, before you come into this class to stay awake, that let people do that. And uh, these little dextrose cubes are nothing more than pure glucose. So this isn't, it isn't so much to get a sweeten, get sweetening power out of it as much as it is just to drive your metabolism, which may have collapsed and uh, you need some glucose to fuel it. So let's look and see how much money we can make. So with high fructose corn syrup at 42%, uh, the price is 18 cents per pound wet. It's also priced on a dry basis as 25.7 pounds. What's the conversion between the, these two numbers? One's a wet basis, one's a dry basis. So what would be the, how would you get from one number to the other? Well, see, 70% solids. So what would I divide this by to get this number? 0.7. And here's the 55%. Now it sells at 20 cents a pound wet and 28.5 cents a pound dry. What would I divide this by to get that? 0.7. Now why is this more expensive? Why is 55% more expensive than 42%? You have more processing. Glucose corn syrup, you see, why is it cheaper than these two? Yes. Less processing. Okay. How do I get from this number to that number? 0. 0.6. 0. 0.6. Okay. And here's glucose, and it's selling for 26.8 cents a pound dry, which is actually more than the high fructose corn syrup. Isn't that interesting? Why do you think that is? What did I have to do to get there? The I had to evaporate all the water at 1,100 BTUs a pound. You put a lot of energy into that. So it, it's payback time. And so how do I get from this number to that number? <laughs> Good. Well, some people say divide by zero, uh, multiply, <laughs> multiply by infinity. I mean, you know, and then I send them away. And, uh, or, or people take out their calculators and try to do it, and, and uh, they say, oh, there's no infinity on in my calculator. I don't know why I can't. Um, that's right. And we, you know where I send them. So anyway, for, right? So for example, we can sell 42% high fructose corn syrup for 18 cents a pound from the previous page. So now let's feed these, uh, this this into, remember this was 31.5 pounds of starch we were trying to figure out what to do with in our little cost analysis. So if we can now sell it for um, 18 cents a pound that's wet or 25.7 uh, 25 uh, cents uh, dry, we have 35 pounds of it on a dry basis. Look at that, we can make nine bucks. And so here we have uh, a an excess of $7.67. Well, what do we have to spend that on? We have to mill the corn, because remember, this was just the cost of the corn coming in. So that has to be milled to make the oil and the feed and so forth. And, uh, um, you know, if we can build the plants and depreciate them, uh, it looks like we might have a little cushion here uh, to make some money. So this, at least on a uh, back of the envelope calculation looks pretty good. And the reason I do this for you is I've been through this enough times that I know if I had turned this over to somebody with an MBA, they would have ground numbers for weeks to come to the conclusion that it might be a business we can be in. And one of the things you're going to get out of this class that's going to propel you above the MBA so you can squash them like a bug. <laughs> is you make real simple calculations. I can guarantee you in most every approximation that I'll tell you about in this class, it'll get you 90% of the way to the answer. 
or you be at least plus or minus, within plus or minus 90% of the right answer. And you say, oh, gee, I'm an engineer. <laughs> and, 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 and I've got I've to you know, get it exactly. Well, I tell you, you build something like the Golden Gate Bridge, and you do all the structural calculations, and you get all the steel. You know what you do when you're done? You multiply by two or three. That's called a safety factor. You don't want it to fall down. And you're really not sure if you got it right. So you just sort of throw in a factor of two or three. So why, why you know, I have students who work problem sets, and just because the calculator's got a 16 more numbers after the decimal point, they include them all in there. Forget it. You know the little fix thing on your calculator where you set the decimal point? Set it to zero. So you just get you know, integer numbers out of this thing. That's all you need. <laughs> and um, forget all the rest of this stuff. And uh, you, know, you just don't need it. Uh, life you know, is not that complicated. It's only complicated by people who make it complicated. It doesn't need to be complicated. <laughs> so think, <laughs> think, think simple. Um, you know, anytime you do a complicated, uh, you know, approach a complicated problem and it takes you more than one page of, with a pencil to sort of analyze it, you didn't get the message. Okay? Go to business school or something else. You, you enjoy that sort of stuff. Mean. Means it attracts water. Yeah, uh, attracts water. Um, okay, so let's look at the flow sheet. Remember, we're, we've, we've now had this concept of making high fructose corn syrup as a means of capturing the value in the starch. Uh, we've done a little economic analysis. It says, hey, at least it doesn't look like we're going to immediately turn gold into lead. And let's see if we can. Uh, conceive of a flow sheet. So we have our starch containing raw materials, uh, which is corn in this case. Uh, we might have to purify it. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, it might mean uh, get uh, the dirt out of it, uh, nuts and bolts, things that come in. Uh, maybe a farmer or two fell in there, you know, clean it all up. <laughs> and um, then we get our co-products out. Uh, through the milling process, the gluten and the meal, the feed, the oil, and so forth. And now we take the starch, which comes out of here, and we dump it into a process in the blue box called liquefaction. Now, the, the starch, when it comes in, it's, it's got particles, right? It's got, the, the, you can imagine, it's, it's uh, uh, got particulate matter in it, just like uh, corn on the cob. I mean, if you eat a corn on the cob, you know, and grind it up in your mouth, and then hawk it out in your, in your hand, it's, it's, it's kind of like a mash, isn't it? You know, have you ever done that? You know, you, maybe, you, maybe you coughed or something, and, and you, oh, it's, it's a mash. Maybe I could turn that into something. And so you take this stuff, and you, you add some water to it to kind of get it into a suspension, and you add alpha amylase, this enzyme. And the alpha amylase breaks this up into glucose and dimers of glucose and trimers of glucose. And then the next one is what's called saccharification, which is a fancy word for making sugar. And what that does is you break up the dimers and trimers into glucose. So this is where we get the glucose. So we have a dextrose purification plant. Well, if it's not exactly complete, there may be some stuff in there, some garf fell in it. Uh, you want to make sure it's nice and clean. And then you isomerize it with glucose isomerase. And out of that comes this equilibrium 42% high fructose corn syrup. Now, we have a couple choices here. We can go this way, go here, boom, come over here and make 42% high fructose corn syrup. Or we can go into a separator, and what's going to be running out in this stream? Some glucose. So we take some of the glucose out of here, run it back into here, and isomerize it and come back through here again, and we can actually enhance the concentration of fructose relative to glucose and create a 55%. Why is it 55%? That's just the way it is. I mean, you, I couldn't make it 56, I could make it 54. But it is a commodity on the open market, and commodity markets would, be, would go crazy if they had 150 high fructose corn syrup uh, products that had to be priced and tracked. There's kind of an agreement in the world markets at 55%. Could you go higher? Yeah, you could go higher, but really you're putting more uh, processing cost into that. And the real question you have to ask yourself is, what's happening to the sweetening power? Because that's what this is sold for. 
And so once you get to a certain sweetening power, the amount of money you're putting in to make it sweeter just doesn't uh, uh, make it. So there's an optimum uh, here. And uh, so these are the two main products that are, that are sold. And what is this stream called? That's a recycle stream. See that embedded in here? It's a recycle stream. Now, what are these little things over here in the red boxes? What do we need them for? Yeah, Fred? So, uh, this isn't about that. I was wondering how the sweetening power is better. Why is it better? How, or how is it measured? Oh, how is it measured? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, it's measured by taste panels. Okay. Yeah, because we don't have, although there is a company uh, in Hayward that claims to have made with silicon a human tongue. It just sounds so nasty. I was, <laughs> there's another one that claims to have made a nose. And uh, so, you know, for aromas and odors and, uh, and uh, for, for taste. But uh, it's interesting. It's sort of like making wine. When you make wine, even though I, I do a lot of work actually for the um, Gallo uh, Winery, uh, I run their technical advisory board uh, only because they would then give my son a job who was an English major and he, he, needed, he needed work. And so he said to me after he graduated, he said, uh, what do I do now? And I said, what'd you major in? He said, Eng English. I said, it's too late. <laughs> I have no, I can't help you. And um, uh, so I actually had a pretty good deal. He went down and uh, worked on this uh, script with Matt Damon and Ben Affleck called Goodwill Hunting. And that put him, that took care of him for about five years until he spent all of it. Uh, but he went down to South America and hung out in Costa Rica and was a ski instructor at Vail and, and uh, was in these extreme ski movies and stuff until he sort of broke all his arms and legs. And so now he's working for Gallo. But anyway, for, for Gallo or any winery, the way that uh, uh, the, uh, the winemaker tells whether or not things are working out is by tasting. You know, you can run it through a mass spec and a chromatograph, an LCMS, anything you want. MRI, CAT scan. Uh, you just can't figure out whether it's going to be really good or not. Um, so that's, that's how they do it. Um, you know, one of the things, though, that you don't know about is, is um, uh, uh, about sweeteners is peop people always look uh, you know, for sucrose or glucose and fructose. But you know, there's this great story of this uh, chemist at uh, Cyril. Cyril's a pharmaceutical company. And he's doing exactly, well, I think chemists probably do this. I mean, engineers don't do this. They've had lab courses too. But he's, he's going along lapping up his, uh, his lab bench, you know, at the end of the day. It's a way of cleaning it off, I guess. And he comes across this little puddle, and it's really sweet. And he's licking it up. And so he tries to figure out, you know, what was that little puddle? And he was working with amino acids. And he had taken phenylalanine, which is amino acid, and aspartic acid, which is another one of the 20 amino acids that naturally inhabit the proteins in our body. And he had coupled them together and made this diamino acid. And it was terribly sweet. Now, that was totally serendipity. I mean, if he hadn't been lapping along, <laughs> we may never have had this. We may never have had aspartame. Uh, which is the, the sweetener that is put into um, a lot of soft drinks. And um, the only problem with it as a sweetener is if you have phenylketonuria, which is, a genetically in, uh, which is an inherited genetic disease, which allows you, does, does not allow you to process phenylalanine terribly efficiently, so it builds up. If you get too much of it, uh, you certainly don't want to be drinking Diet Coke or something like that. That's why there's those little signs. says phenylketonurics, don't drink this, uh, if you know you are one. Um, and usually people do, because you have to be on very special diets. But other than that, it appears to be really quite good, although there's some indications that it's a brain neurotoxin. But uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's probably one of those things you have to you know, drink you know, a million gallons a day for it to uh, affect you. But... Uh, just putting that out there. You just never know what's going to be sweet from one time to another. Oh, I should tell you, 
Uh, just to give you an idea of the processing on these, uh, on these plants, the, um, the liquefaction plant, it, takes, it, it, runs, uh, a bat, it runs on a batch, so that means that the stuff's dumped into it. Uh, it's held for about three hours at a pH of six or seven at about 300 degrees F for about 30 minutes, and then it's uh, heated up to about 185, uh, cooled to about 140 F for about 30 minutes, another 30 minutes. So, so what happens, it gets poured in, it's really hot, you know, uh, 300 F. I mean, that's, you know, boiling. And that's pretty amazing that the enzyme can survive in that uh, conditions. But did you know that, uh, well, I think I told you that most uh, detergents today have enzymes in them. And uh, those enzymes are thermophilic. They can operate in, not only in hot water in your washing machine, but at pH, you know, 11 or 12. And they get those characters by going out to places where little microbes live in really hot environments, like bubbling mud pots in Yellowstone. And they extract that capability of being thermophilic, which means of protecting its own enzymes, that organism's own enzymes, and in stitching new modalities of functionality into the organism in order to make these special enzymes that work in these unusual environments. The saccharification, that's about a 40 to 90 hour uh, process at pH 4 at about 140 degrees. And the isomerization is about a 30 minute process, pH roughly neutral between 140 and 150 degrees. So you can see right away there's a a problem here in that the saccharification step is really slow. So that tells you that either you're going to have to have a lot of capacity here, because if you think about it, stuff's moving through the plant, and then if it has to slow down and sit, one way to think about that is to spread the plant out this way, which means you, you that's what we call asynchronous planning, because if you just let the slow step uh, govern the rate of your process, it, this, the whole process could be too slow. So you could have multiple units of those uh, uh, working for you, and you can sometimes accomplish uh, a, a means of essentially accelerating the process. The, um, so these, these are both batch processes. This happens to be a, a continuous packed column process, so it's a little different. And they each require these enzymes, these three enzymes. So you have, a cho you have a, actually a choice. You can either go buy the enzyme from a company that makes them, or you can make the enzymes yourself. But regardless of which you do, there's got to be an alpha amylase plant somewhere, a glucoamylase plant, and a glucose isomerase plant. So one of the things we'll do is we'll just take a look at uh, one of these enzyme plants. Let's look at the glucose isomerase plant. So this is kind of interesting. You probably hadn't thought about the fact that there is another whole plant with another flow sheet sitting out here, uh, which we need to design to make the glucose isomerase. And you start with a tank, with a, that's a stir bar, and that's a pump. Uh, this is called a fermenter, because where do we get the glucose isomerase? We get it from growing bacteria. And the bacteria are little cells. And glucose isomerase is only one of the many, many enzymes that that microorganism is going to make. So we have to get it out of the cell. So the first thing we have to do is do what to the cells after we've grown? We've got to lyse them or break them open. And you can do that in a homogenizer. There's a variety of ways of doing it. You can do it by fluid mechanics, by shear. You can do it by maceration. But you've got to break them open, and once you break them open and they spill their guts out, you need to go through a series of filter presses, of precipitation processes, membrane ultrafiltration processes. This is where you have a membrane that passes some things and not others. Uh, until you finally get down here and you've got the glucose isomerase separated from all the other stuff. That, that's a daunting problem. And then what do you do with it? Because you, you may actually be in the business of making this and selling it to the high fructose corn syrup people. And down here it shows you uh, uh, three ways that you can, you can do it. Um, oh, I see. What this is. Why do we have this old one in here, Max? Huh? 
The other one disappeared. I can see why, because this one doesn't work. There we go. Um, so it, uh, you come down here with your glucose isomerase. And one of the things you can do is you can put it in a vacuum freeze dryer. So you can, this is in a liquid form with the glucose isomerase dissolved in it. So in a vacuum freeze dryer, uh, this is a way of getting rid of all the water without having to heat it up. Because if you heat an enzyme solution up too hot, you can trash the enzyme. So that's called a freeze dryer. I don't know if any of you had uh, these cereals that have freeze dried uh, fruit in them. You know, if you don't let it sit in the milk long enough, you just have a whole mouth of broken teeth. It's like eating a whole bunch of BBs. You know, and they're supposed to be strawberries and banana chips and stuff. It's, it's, it's horrible, nasty stuff. Um, and then you put this in a rotary a dryer. All that is a big tube that rotates, and it's on a little angle, and the stuff works its way down. You've got a fire here uh, blowing hot air back up from right to left, and it, it dries it. And you get something called sweet zyme flakes. And so that's what they're sold as. They look like little corn flakes, except they're glucose isomerase. In this one, there's a spray dryer. You actually take the liquid, you put it through essentially what looks like a shower head at the top of a very big tube. You push hot air up. The liquid falls and evaporates until finally the solids is all that's left. And it's like a big snowstorm at the bottom. That's how they make detergents. You know, liquid detergents, granular detergents are generally made in spray dryers. Or you can put it through an extruder. Um, my little granddaughter loves this, this uh, dough, uh, colored dough. What's it called? Play-Doh. And, and they actually have little extruders. And you can jam it in there and turn a handle. And it comes out you know, in the form of a star or a little square and stuff. So we make all kinds of things. Well, this is just a big, big extruder. You're sticking this stuff through there. And it's just a big Play-Doh thing. And you can make little sweet zyme cylinders. They look like dog food. And that's how dog food's made, by the way. You know, you feed your dog the little things, little, uh, or Muffy, the cat. Feed the, oh, we had a bad experience with our cat. Did I tell you about this? Or the, uh, our dog, started with our dog. Dog gets a tick. And so my wife says, the dog has a tick. And I says, well, it'll, it'll go away. Tick will suck enough blood and it will go away. It's a big dog, little tick. It's not going to bleed the dog to death. <laughs> And, and let the tick live. She says, no, we've got to get it out. We've got to get it out. Don't pull on it. You'll, you know, you pull his head. And my wife says, Donna, she says, my dad told me a, 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 good, a good thing. You just light a match, uh, hold it up to the tick's butt. And then a tuck, the tick is getting big because it's full of blood. And then the tick feels the, its it butt's on fire. And so it, it backs out to look because it's head. So if it looks, then its head's out by definition because its eyes are on its head. So it's looking back. <laughs> and then you grab the tick. And then it's OK. So I went to get some matches, and I come back, and I strike the match, and I go up to it. And all of a sudden, whoof. And the dog explodes in this blue flame, jumps in his basket where the cat happens to be sleeping, and catches the cat on fire. And the cat takes off in flames. I got a dog in flames. The cat goes out in flames. I said, what happened? And she says, well, you know, our daughter's a doctor. I said, yeah, I know, but what does that have to do? We've got two animals on fire running around. <laughs> And she says, well, uh, you were going to go up and do some like, surgery and, and stuff, so I just poured alcohol all over the tick. To, <laughs> and of course, I went up there with a match and just boom. It was like creme brulee. I mean, it was a friggin' mess. Of, this cat comes back with all its hair all gone. I don't know. It ran out in the sprinklers. And uh, yeah, I should have dried the cat off in the microwave. You know that one. And so, uh, so it was a bad, a, bad, a bad day at the Robertson household. So, so let's just do a quick calculation and we'll get, uh, get the hell out of here. Uh, so we got some high fructose corn syrup design calculations. So let's calculate the principal flow rates for a process. We're going to capture 5% of the national high fructose corn syrup you know, domestic consumption. So the question is, is, how much high fructose corn syrup do we need? And how much enzyme is going to be required to, to convert this uh, starch into uh, our, our products? And what size of fermenter are we going to need to produce the enzyme we, we compute we need? So these are the kinds of design calculations that we'd have to think about and go through. 
So here's a high fructose corn syrup production. So you remember this was the number quoted as the domestic uh, sales of 55% uh, high fructose corn syrup wet. So this is what you, you, you get as your input. We multiply it by 0.05 because we're going to make what? 5%. We multiply it by 0.7 because we're going to work on what kind of a basis? A dry basis. So this is wet. Multiply it by 0.7. That'll give us the weight dry. These are just conversions. And so on a dry basis, and if you forget what you're doing, write dry basis so you don't make a mistake, uh, 2 times 10 to the 11th grams per year. So how much fructose is this for 55% high fructose corn syrup? So remember, this is the amount of, of high fructose corn syrup total. So how much fructose is in there? Well, you just take the weight, multiply it by 0.55. And that gives you, and I happen to put it in moles just to uh, entertain you. So you can you know, put it whatever units you want. So a million moles of fructose a day is, is what our little plant is going to have to uh, produce. That's pretty cool. Now, the next question is, let's take uh, glucose isomerase. Let's, let's size the glucose isomerase plant. So if you say, well, how much glucose isomerase do we need? Then you scratch your head as an engineer, and you say, well, gee, how fast does glucose isomerase convert um, glucose to a mixture of fructose and, and glucose? So you would, who, who would you go ask that question? Who would know that? The biologist. You call up, the, you could look in the yellow pages, you call up the biologist and you say, okay, I've got some, uh, I've, I've got some, fr uh, some stuff here, I want to convert it. I want to make some fructose from some glucose. I know how much fr uh, fructose I need to make. And he says, well, <clears throat> this glucose isomerase, its activity is defined in terms of units of activity. That's how you buy it. And one unit of activity is the amount or the mass of enzyme that will convert one micromole of glucose to fructose per minute. Now, that's not my unit. I didn't invent it. Don't get mad at me. But this is, what, this is the kind of stuff you have to deal with. And you say, well, that's no problem. I'm a chemical engineer, and I know how to do my calculations. I draw my lines like this so I don't make any mistakes. This is the amount of, of moles of fructose I need to make each day go through some time uh, uh, conversions here. And I know that I can convert 10 to the minus, I can get 10 to the minus 6 gram moles of fructose per unit per minute with this enzyme. And so I need, I need what? A billion, nearly a billion units of activity. Wow. So how big of a fermenter do I need in order to make this much glu glucose isomerase in terms of activity? Now let's assume for a uh, argument that we're going to make all the enzyme in one batch and that it lasts a year. Enzymes don't last forever. So you've got you to add them, you've got to make them over and over again. We'll say, well, just make one batch. And we'll make it, it lasts a year. And then at the end of the year, I'll make another batch. And that's the way my plant's going to run. So uh, you can look at the lab data, and it says, well, how fast can I produce a unit of activity? This is how many units of activity I need. How fast can I do it? You go back to the biologist, and the biologist says, well, you can get two units of activity produced per ml of volume by bacillus coagulans, which is a microorganism, in one week. Oh, you say, fine. I need this many units of activity. I can get two units per mil. And there I go. I get a volume out of this. 590 cubic meters is the volume I'm going to need to produce this many units. Okay, I can do it in a week. What's, a unit of What's that? What is a unit of activity? A unit of activity is this up here, the amount of enzyme that will convert. So it's the mass, grams of enzyme. Well, now you say 590 cubic meters. Are you going to just call up the fermenter company and say, I want a 590 cubic meter fermenter, please? No, you say, how big is that? Does this, does this make sense? Always ask the question about scale. And you kind of look around, and you, you, you type into Google, largest fermenter on Earth. And it comes back, it's 1,500 cubic meters. And you go, what? You mean I'd have to make a fermenter that's about a third the size of the largest fermenter on Earth to make my little glucose isomerase for my little high fructose corn syrup plant that's only making 5% of the domestic demand? That doesn't sound right. But 
shoot, then I'd make all the enzyme I need in a week. Well, I've actually got all year. So why don't I figure out that I'm just going to be making enzyme all the time? One week, batches of one week. Well, so then uh, a standard fermenter generally is about 9,000 liters. And so 9,000 liters, if I take this, with a cycle time of one week, I could, have, I, I could have one fermenter this size operating for 66 weeks and make that many units. So all of a sudden you say, oh, that idea of trying to make it all in one week, well, that wasn't too smart. But I can get a much smaller fermenter and I can just run it every week. Now, what does that mean? Of course, I don't have all the units I need, do I, until uh, the end of that year is up. All right, so you guys, oh, man, this is like, uh, you know, I'm going in circles here. But, okay, so you're going to have to gauge the startup of your plant to accommodate this. But also, I said at the end of a year, the enzyme's dead. So the enzyme you made at the first of the year is dead by the time you get it all made at the end of the year. So you're probably going to have to have several of these in order to get lockstep into this. And I can tell you something about this, this uh, fermenter. It didn't work. A friend of mine designed it. <laughs> he didn't take this class. Didn't take this class because he wouldn't have done this. He was actually living in Britain. And then after he designed it, he moved to the US. Uh, <laughs> what he did is, is he wanted to convert, he wanted to make animal feed from methane. And uh, he had these organisms that could eat methane and they would grow. And then the idea was is you'd take these organisms and just chop them up and macerate them and put them through an extruder, and you'd make these little pellets, which you could feed the animals, because it was high in protein. And, but since you're feeding this to animals, cows in England, uh, and there's a lot of cows. And you're not using their methane, by the way, which would be a, a good recycle problem <laughs> if you could capture it all. But you can imagine running around with little balloons, you know, catching it, and then put, taking it and running back to your plant. Um, so, he figured, I need a 1,500 cubic meter fermenter to, to, to make enough of this stuff uh, to make it cost effective. And they actually built it. And they built it by a small town, a little village outside of Oxford. It's a huge fermenter. I mean, this thing was, you know, 20 stories high. And it was, it was 100 yards in diameter. I mean, this was a big, big fermenter. And they fill it up and they put the bugs in and they start pumping the methane in and they turn it on. And then the worst thing that can happen, these organisms happen to also make surfactant, which is essentially soap. And the fermenter foamed and slimed the entire town. <laughs> this foam went down, it was about 30 feet high it was like the blob, and it came down through, through the town, over the town, and, 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 and down onto the A1. And he saw this thing going, and that's when he got, went down to Heathrow. And, and, uh, so uh, they, they turned it off, and they waited for the town to unslime, and uh, they decided, the British decided they didn't want this. But they did sell about 30 of them to the Russians. And, um, and I don't know what happened over there, but um, uh, he's, he's, he's now um, living under an assumed name uh, in the St. Louis area. Now, one last thing. How much these bugs that we make the glucose isomerase from, they've got to eat, don't they? And what do you think they eat? Just like you and I, they eat glucose. What? If they needed to eat so much glucose that they ate all our product. See, that would be turning gold into lead. So one thing you get to figure out is that how much glucose do I have to put into the glucose isomerase fermenter? I better make that calculation. So you go back to your biologist friend and say, by the way, how much glucose did you have to feed these little guys? He says, oh, thanks for asking. Three units of enzyme per milligram of glucose. So here's how many units we have to make. Here's how many units. Oh, 865 pounds of glucose to make all that. Well, how many pounds of high fructose corn syrup are we making? In what units? Grams? Tons. Tons. So right away, you can see, we can probably spare 800. I mean, you could go to Safeway and get this if you had to. So you'd say, OK, whew, I'm off the hook on that one. I'm not going to. Uh, 
So you see, this is how you go through these calculations, and you make them real simple, but you ask the right questions. Because wouldn't it have been really sad if, if you had built this plant and found out that you had to take your entire product stream and ship it over to the, high, the glucose isomerase plant just to make the enzyme so you can make more product that you could feed back to those organisms? <laughs> that would have been a great business. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.